We are talking about digital public global good, but also for digital public infrastructure. So what we are talking about is actually how can we support countries with digital public infrastructure across sectors, not only for the health sector, not only for the education, we are also talking about climate health, but also other sectors. How can we build capacity on building digital solution for the global, that is a global good for a country? So I have to mention that um, it's not um, a coincidence that Lin Marty is presenting here as a first speaker, because Lin Marty was one of the I have I can say that one of the uh, taking the initiative of a collaboration that um, ended up with the nine uh, PhD students uh, being supported by NORAD in order to build capacity on uh, on uh, digital public good. Build, uh, on also on building how to build digital public infrastructure in countries. And Maleke will be um, representing the nine PhD students. Heavy burden. No? <laughs> we couldn't have all the nine, but we will have Limarte to talk about the concept, the Global uh, Digital Public Good Alliance, and giving us some, some concept to discuss later in the panel. Then Pamud will talk about SS2 and DPG for DPI. And then Maleke will, uh, then Maleke will use a, do a country story from Ethiopia and from his research. And then we will have uh, Chaminda Verabadana. Okay. <laughs> Sri Lanka Ministry of Health in Sri Lanka, also being a member of the DPG Alliance, new member. So also we'll use the, the, the Sri Lanka story as a case in order to be able to discuss later. And then we will have a panel. You are allowed to, uh, to ask questions, but you have to wait for the panel discussion. So sorry, but write it down. And we try to keep quite a lot of time for discussion as well. So over to you, Lynn Marte. Thank you so much. Um, confirming that everyone can hear me. It's a small room, so uh, I'm not too worried, but can online people hear me as well? Yeah. Um, so uh, there's a lot of acronyms going on, but hopefully we'll be a bit wiser after uh, after this session. Uh, as Kristen said, my name is Liv. I lead something called the Digital Public Goods Alliance. I will mention briefly what that is. Um, and I'm very happy to be here. I think it's my third, maybe fourth year in a row. Last year I was virtual uh due to uh to uh sickness but uh, it's very nice to be here in person and i'm always extremely inspired when i meet this uh his community um and uh, i will come back to that actually because it's a very important part of uh, of um why i'm here um and i will be uh, i will be studying christine's reactions because you know i am uh, I'm, I, and I will be studying your uh, everyone's reactions because i'm really interested to find out in terms of like the the delineation of of, uh, of uh, infrastructure or not. And I think Pamud will have some reflections on this too and kind of whether or not we end up saying that DHIS2 is infrastructure or not, but actually that is not what matters most to me. And I'll also come back to why. Um, so that was a bit of a teaser. Um, but uh, before that, uh, let me just start with the definition of digital public goods. Um, and the concept of digital public goods comes from a UN Secretary General uh, high-level panel um, that was put together in 2018 to look at how to enhance international digital cooperation for attainment of the Sustainable Development Goals. And anyone who knows the HIS2, which I assume that everyone in this room does, will know that the HIS2 came long, 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 long before 2018. Um, and I was actually part of this I was an advisor to one of the ministers who was in this panel, and I can say that DHIS2 and the existence of the HISP community was actually a huge influence for this high-level panel and the experience that um, that had been seen in how uh, how uh, digital public goods or <laughs> DHIS2 was a very good example of how collaboration could happen around open source to, uh, to uh, accelerate one of the sustainable development goals, or actually multiple sustainable development goals. So uh, you were part really much of the, I tell her, you were very much part of the origin story of this high-level panel, and the concept of digital public goods was born 
uh, in the panel. So it kind of brought it together. But what we also discovered, and I think that's an important point, was that, yes, DHIS2 was maybe the most scaled and kind of most also um, advanced example and still is of building a community also around uh, a digital public good. There were many other initiatives ongoing that no one or there was very little cross awareness of them. And one of the things we saw was that there was a lot happening also, for instance, related to open source to build out digital identity systems, payments, uh, and so on. So that was also part of this kind of discussions that happened in this panel. Um, what also came out, so there was a recommendation in this high-level panel that also led to the for formation of the Digital Public Goods Alliance, which I lead. Um, and it's a global alliance with a secretariat of uh, about 11 people based all over the world. Um, and we now have more than 40 members, uh, many country members, including Ethiopia, including Sri Lanka, just pointing to some of the, those I know. Norway is also a member uh, in terms of Norway, uh, also as a, as a digitalization uh, and an internal digitalization policy. So it's not only the international development side of Norway, which I think is a very important point. Uh, Estonia is a member, Singapore is a member, and I'm just mentioning some uh, random examples, so to speak, because we have, um, we have uh, 13 countries now, and there are more on the way in. Uh, also a number of UN entities, so UNICEF, UNDP, uh, Tech Envoy's Office, uh, to mention some FAO. Um, and we have uh, Gates Foundation and a number of philan philanthropies and also some um, uh, technology companies and uh, like uh, GitHub, for instance, are members. And we are all working to uh, accelerate the attainment of the sustainable development goals, leveraging these digital public goods. And there's a definition and the standard for digital public goods that um, is being stewarded by the Secretariat. And the standard is an operationalization of the definition from the UN Secretary General. And now there is more than 160 digital public goods in the registry that you will find. Uh, Taylor represents one of them also. So <laughs> just to to mention that. Um, and uh, and um, we're seeing that, of course, there is a lot in health and education because of the uh, where there was most happening, I guess, in, in uh, particularly in international development assistance funded, but we're also seeing a lot more coming in, uh, including in what I will then be talking about as DPI. And when we talk about um, and digital public goods and digital public infrastructure. First of all, I mean, it's it's easy to go a bit crazy by this, the acronyms. Um, and and uh, as I mentioned, so I, I pasted again the definition of DPGs here, and they are always open source. I think that's very important to mention. Like maybe the key distinguishing factor is they have to be open source. Um, and um, but compared to uh, digital public infrastructure, if you look at the registry and the 160 plus DPGs there, they are not always foundational, as in cross-sectorally enabling. You can have literacy learning applications that can be verified as digital public goods against the DPG standard. They can be great. There's nothing about like being good or not. They can be fantastic. But they are, uh, there are many DPGs that are kind of single sector purpose, and they are made for a specific domain. Um, and then the uh, definition of digital public infrastructure. I will say that this is a definition that <laughs> there are several definitions, first of all. Uh, it's not like there's uniform alignment, and it's a very geopolitical term. Um, it was um, fronted very strongly by India during the G20 presidency last year. It is also being uh, fronted very strongly now by Brazil under the current G20 presidency. And there is not complete alignment on what goes in and what falls under and what does not fall under. But there's pretty much alignment that the, when we're talking about cross-sectorally, horizontally enabling society-wide capabilities. And then I think it varies what people put into those boxes. Um, but I think there is also emerging pretty strong alignment that the most proven components or where people tend to agree is that they uh, encompass uh, verifiable digital identity and then uh, 
very often that is by default also seen to include civil registration and vital statistics. Um, it's real-time payments and secure data exchange. Those are the most um, proven components that everyone uh, agrees on. And then you will hear many discussions as to, for instance, how does AI fit in? Um, and you will have some that are starting also to talk about certain AI components, but there's a lot to figure out what they are. Uh, and uh, and um, um, uh, so you will see, for instance, that an uh, institution like the Center for Digital Public Infrastructure, they operate actually with five different components. And I actually encourage you to go into their website to see their reflections about what digital public infrastructure is. And they're even saying that it can't be defined, but they're saying that you can take a digital public infrastructure approach to how you build. Um, and focusing on reusability across sectors. And I think that's also something to come back to. Um, but for um, for the purpose of this conversation, because I think it's, uh, it's, it's more useful, I will stick with this one where um, as core or foundational DPI components, and this is actually something I stole from uh, OpenSPP, which is another digital public good. <laughs> and they were actually quite happily placing OpenSPP and themselves in the sector and domain landscape. Um, uh, they had social protection written out. I've adapted it a little bit. And, uh, and they were quite happily saying that um, Whereas uh, there were these core DPI components that were digital identity and CRES, data exchange and digital payments, they were providing social protection, very much enabled by these underlying comp uh, components. But of course, does not, saying, uh, does not mean that OpenSPP is not useful. And I have, for the purpose of my thinking, and I'm uh, excited to hear also how this fits in with the way uh, HISPIN uh, sees the world of DHIS2 is that DHIS2 is very much a, a multi-domain uh, um, DPG. It has uh, evolved from starting mainly in health to, uh, and I don't know how many sectors DHIS2 is used in now, but I think there's a lot. Um, and it's critically relevant, I think, and I am very interested to hear the reflections on this in the in the discussion afterwards, to see more integrations between DHIS2 and some of these components. And I'm curious to hear how you think that helps enable various use cases in countries based on what you're seeing. Um, and then I think we can have a discussion as to when does something actually go from being sector domain specific to become a DPI? Like <laughs> there is a gray zone here, I think uh, probably. I don't think that matters so much to be honest. Because I think there is a lot of focus now on DPI, but mostly there's a focus on delivering um, use cases that mean something in countries and to actually enable uh, critical functionalities and to uh, enable sector impact. And I do think that DHIS2 is playing a huge role in enabling cross-sector impact. But um, we can save that for the discussion of how to group it. Uh, but this is at least, I think, one useful way of simplifying. And then you will hear someone who will say that cloud is also DPI. <laughs> you will hear someone that will say that the internet itself is DPI. And, you know, yes, I think you can probably argue that the original DPI is the internet. I think still it makes sense to talk about the need to scale these foundational components um, to enable a lot of the impact we want to see today, assuming that there is more widespread internet uh, coverage and also assuming that there's a lot happening here. It doesn't mean that it's not uh, it's not challenges related to cloud and data hosting and so on, which I can imagine that DHIS2 and the HISP community knows a lot about. But um, there is still a need to be able to also galvanize energy around something. And um, um, there is a lot of momentum now around mobilizing more financing, but also kind of understanding for from different international development initiatives that typically have financed these kind of functionalities, but for individual sectors. There's a huge problem that there has been, um, uh, and often donor-driven, uh, countries have been encouraged to build out, you know, identities for education, identities for health, identities for this and that. Um, and at the same time, 
um, I mean, you would never in the physical world build one road only to the hospitals, one road only to the schools. It's not the way it works with infrastructure. So the discussion about how to better leverage cross-sectoral infrastructure and to also ensure that um, sector-funded initiatives integrate with them and how we can ensure that. That is something I think there's a lot of attention around. Um, also a lot of resistance because financing doesn't really encourage infrastructure. It's really hard to find money for infrastructure. So that's, um, I would love to hear reflections from this group because there's so many different countries involved. Um, and uh, and uh, you have seen so much uh, on the ground um, as a community uh, on, on how we can enable this better. So I think there's not a better community to ask these questions to than the HISP community. Um, there are now also initiatives that are bringing together countries um, to really encourage more learnings and best practice exchanges around how to do that. So there's a campaign. I'll mention it because uh, I hope you will hear about it. And um, it involves many of the same countries. It's called 50 in 5. And it's about 50 countries building out one or more of these D uh, DPI components in five years. Um, and it's based on countries who are already doing it. So it's based on seeing that there are so many countries that have embarked on these journeys at the same time to try to bring countries together to exchange learnings and best practices. And many countries are implementing digital public goods as part of doing that. Uh, so to mention some examples, there is MOSIP, uh, the Modular Open Source Identity Platform. I see Ethiopia, I see Sri Lanka. Um, uh, both countries are implementing MOSIP. There are many others as well. Um, there's also payments. Uh, you have Mojoloop, uh, OpenG2P, and, uh, and other um, uh, DPGs in the payment space. And XROAD is an example being implemented for secure data exchange. Um, it's a core part of the digital public infrastructure in Estonia, Finland, and, uh, and Iceland. Um, so those are some examples, but given that many countries are now using DPGs to build out these DPI layers at the same time as I'm guessing that nearly all of these countries also have uh, existing HISP communities and have, <laughs> have implemented DHIS2 at some time uh, and are still, uh, still using it. I do think there's a great opportunity to try to plug together somehow or to tap into, so to speak, the HISP community because you have such an amazing experience of how to build hub structures, how to facilitate learnings across countries and so on. And I'm really, really hoping that we can feed this into this landscape as well. So that is not a small ambition. And maybe it's a bit cheeky to uh, come and ask for this, but I do think there's a lot of uh, potential win-wins. Um, so, uh, and, and I would love to hear reflections from uh, the audience afterwards in the Q&A session on how you have seen uh, the existence or lack of these components impacting implementations of DHIS2. So basically, what could have been different if you could have um, uh, depended on the existence of, for instance, verifiable digital identity or, uh, or real-time payment systems or the other way around? How did it actually help something or integrate uh, and make uh, enable better services? So with that, uh, I will end with some thoughts of what I would like to see happen. And uh, and I haven't made this kind of product specific. First of all, I would love to see that there are DPG alternatives for all of these foundational components so that there is more choice in that space as well. Because so far it is, um, it is not as built out. We're trying to so help identifying where the gaps are in terms of where there are no open source alternatives. Um, I would love to see more pathways where you really show that it's possible to for a uh, to leverage DPGs to kind of go the whole way to deliver on high priority use cases. So from the foundational these um, original components, but uh, that I mentioned for ID payment, secure data exchange, and how they can link in with the uh, uh, DPGs such as DHIS to to deliver. Uh, on high priority use cases and see examples of pathways. Um, then I think there is also the uh, critical topic of government capacity and the frameworks to manage these processes. Again, what can we learn and leverage from the HISP community? 
And lastly, also, uh, again, the academic and private sector communities and ecosystems. I think there's a lot of, um, of uh, demand and, and um, uh, also um, um, countries are really, really uh, signaling that it's important to have more local vendor ecosystem involvement in, in some of these large. And for, for instance, for building out digital identity systems, the systems integrator contracts are huge. So these are really big um, uh, big vendor opportunities, and I think there's a strong urge from many countries to ensure that there is more local value creation uh, happening as part of that. How can we ensure that? Funding will be part of it, and I think it's very important that there is funding, so both, and I'm aware that DHIS2 and his has recently signed at least one new large agreement. I saw that on social media a few days ago. Um, but I do think the core funding, that remains critically important. Um, both for uh, for the foundational, uh, those that are relevant for DPI, but also for the um, more domain-specific building blocks. And then I think it would be interesting to look more across DPGs to also reduce duplication of functionalities between DPGs, because there is a lot of duplication of functionalities. Because I think even the open source community has a tendency to build, to like to build its own stuff instead of reusing someone else's stuff. That is not only, um, I think that is not something that is unique um, uh, to, uh, and, and I mean, I think the proprietary uh, systems still leverage a lot of open source actually. And uh, maybe DPGs also need to be better at leveraging other DPGs. So um, more kind of joint road mapping and opportunities for DPGs to be together to look at what can be done jointly is something I would like to see more of. And then how can we encourage more contributions back to the core from implementers? And again, I know you have a uh, code of conduct, you have very good practices on encouraging that without forcing it in the license from the HIS2, from what I understand, but it's something that is, you've managed to make it happen dynamically. And how can we spread that? Um, I think a topic that uh, many are feeling the pains of is procurement. Uh, I would love to, <laughs> again, uh, learn from how uh, how you have navigated that. I'm hearing it at least from the DPGs that are um, being uh, uh, considered for, uh, for instance, ID systems and so on, that the procurement processes are pretty, um, they are very much skewed towards uh, business as usual and proprietary. Uh, and I guess all proc many procurement regimes are, but how can we change that uh, so that there is more uh, consideration of open source? Uh, and lastly, the strengthening of, of uh, academia and, uh, and uh, private sector creation locally and the idea of more hubs, uh, which you already have. So these are some of the things I would like to see and uh, my attempt at framing this conversation. So I didn't make it so DHR is too specific. It's more that I would love to tap into what this community has already done and can uh, offer up to those that are actually trying to do a lot of what DHR is too has done. Thank you. So then remember to write down your questions. You will have plenty of time. Well, we'll see. To, to ask them uh, during the panel. So, Pamud, over to you to address all this. Right. Um, good afternoon, everyone. I'm uh, Pamod, representing uh, the HISP Center at the uh, University of Oslo. So the topic is, of course, uh, is on DHIS2 for DPI. So as you can see, it's an uh, evolution over three decades. So I can cover only so much in like uh, this 20 minutes or so. But uh, we have so many um, DHIS2 experts here, including product managers. So feel free to jump in uh, during the panel discussion so that we can discuss in detail. Right. So. Uh, Yes, Bob, please. <laughs> You're welcome. So what I'm uh, planning to cover within this 20 minutes is uh, I will just uh, briefly explain this concept of building block. And then we'll talk uh, briefly about evolution of DHIS2. And then 
uh, how DHS2 by design is uh, supporting this uh, more like a DPG, DPI kind of uh, uh, functionality. And then we will also talk about uh, some of the domains where DHS2 is currently implemented. And uh, we'll also talk briefly about interoperability. And most importantly, how we have been able to achieve this uh, as a product. Right, so um, uh, I think we've already highlighted two concepts, which is about DPG and DPI. And I'm now quoting uh, one of the publications uh, from the Digital Public Goods Alliance uh, website uh, and the concept of building block. So this is at least two years old. So I don't know how much uh, this has evolved over the last two years. But uh, essentially, I just want to pitch this definition. So um, um, what, what they mean by building blocks are soft, software codes, platforms, and applications that are interoperable, which provide a basic digital service at scale and can be reused uh, for multiple cases and contexts. So there's a lot more uh, that, that is going on, but I just wanted to pitch on these uh, four characteristics that they have mentioned. So one is about uh, the, the, uh, the building blocks being autonomous. So what we mean by being autonomous is they can be used as standalone components along with some reusable modular components within these platforms. Uh, and and they, are, they can essentially contribute to countries' infrastructure. So that's what we mean by autonomous. And secondly, they are generic, meaning you can use these software platforms across multiple different uh, domains or contexts, use cases. And of course, interoperable, meaning like they, they are able to work with different software platforms. It could be other digital public goods or other software systems. And then, of course, iterative, uh, uh, iterative evolvability, meaning like these software should be able to evolve independent of what they are being used for in a particular use case. So, for example, if you have a digital public good uh, uh, which, which, uh, of which uh, a small fraction is used in a given uh, use case, it can still continue to evolve. So I will try to see at least like how many of these characteristics are present in DHIS2 as a, because it's a very broad topic, but I'm just trying to narrow down my scope. All right, so for this audience, you all know what DHIS2 is. So it is considered as one of the pioneering digital public goods. And essentially it's a management information system. So the thing is like it has been traditionally used in health domain and all of you are aware there is at least as of now, we don't really see very health specific things in DHS2 and that is why we are able to use it across many domains. I will get back to this a bit later. And what it does in a very simplistic manner is to collect data at different levels in our country hierarchies. We have different hierarchies in health, education and whatever different sectors. And it also provides visualization so that this data which is collected can be put into use. So that's a fascinating thing about DHS2. And then, of course, it has uh, evolved over so many years. And due to that, now we are seeing DHS2 being used across multiple different uh, domains. And of course, it is interoperable with different software platforms. Right, so I have briefly highlighted uh, the evolution and I'm seeing like a lot of DHS2 legends here who have been here from the very beginning of DHS2 back, the, back I mean, 30 years back. So. You will, I mean, you can all sh share about uh, different uh, milestones, but I just want to highlight like some of these key areas, like the DHIS one from, I mean, when DHIS two evolved, and then of course the web API, and we also have uh, mobile platforms and all these different domains, cross sector domains that uh, DHIS two is is being currently used. So. Essentially, the summary is, is it is currently being used across many different domains, and there are different components which have been evolved over time. Right. So the main thing which is facilitating DHS2 to act as a uh, building block rather than a very typical DPG is it is a, a, is a design of DHS2. So the main thing is its flexibility. So what I mean by flexibility is the flexible data model. So whenever we are asked to implement DHS2 in a particular country or a domain, there is a very simple thing that we ask or that we look for. We try to see, we know like there's a DHS2 data model for aggregate, like for collecting counts, or tracker, which is like collecting at individual level. And we just sim simply try to see whether it matches with the DHS2 data model. So for example, what you are seeing here is a uh, very simplistic uh, overview of DHS2 tracker data model and how we have kind of tried to map it to an education use case, right? So as long as it matches with the DHS2 data model, we are quite confident that we can uh, adopt uh, DHS2 for this use case. If it is not, we will be careful. We might have to, you know, like uh, 
uh, use some additional components or additional methods, processes around it. But this is like a simplistic overview of how we are deciding based on DHS2 data model. Right. The second thing is the customizability. We have seen uh, many software, including DPG, which are super good from a technical perspective, but countries really struggle because you really need IT guys, programmers, and they don't really have it, right? But the main uh, advantage of DHS2 is we have something like this. And what do we see here? Which app this is from? Of course, yes, we have David here, yes. It's a maintenance app, right? So basically, using the front end, we are able to configure DHS2, which is a luxury. Because in many contexts, we don't really have uh, software developers within ministries to help these things. But we, uh, in DH, when we use DHS2, we have these kind of simplistic configuration mechanisms, and that's why it is so popular in countries. And then, of course, it is modular, meaning like DHS2 is very bulky. I mean, like we have how many? I, th I think like I'm seeing so many product managers here. Like you, you guys showed so many awesome things in the morning. But what it is, of course, making DHS2. It's it's making DHS2 bulky, which is fine. But the thing is, when we are implementing in countries, we don't really have to implement everything. The good thing about DHS2 is we can kind of uh, decide whether this country needs probably aggregate and likewise and we have like, I mean, this is a, a screenshot from uh, different co-apps that we have in DHS2. So we can decide what are the different modules which we'll be using in DHS2 when we are implementing in this context. So that's a super cool thing about DHS2. So we get this very big thing, but we can kind of uh, make it lean enough so it, uh, the countries can sustain. And of course, uh, the next thing is the extensibility. So in the morning, we saw a lot of things about the web API and all the different things that are really helping DHS2 to extend. And specifically, I must mention, during the pandemic, one cool thing that, that, uh, that came out of DHS2 is the DHS2 web app framework. So that really supported and helped developers in making web applications really fast. So Thanks to that, we are now seeing uh, so many different applications. I'm just mentioning a few of them, including our uh, brand new climate app. So the good thing is people are designing different DHS2 applications, uh, custom applications. So that is extending the functionality. DHS2 is uh, meant for something very basic. But if you want to extend it, these are there for you to use. So by design, there are a lot of different things that are there in DHS2 supporting the extensibility. So with all that, uh, I didn't get, go into too much of detail, but with all that, what we are seeing is so many different domains uh, which is used in DHS2 in country context. So we'll be hearing more about some of these use cases uh, from our country uh, stakeholders here, but I will only mention two domains, right? So, uh, I mean, these are two domains I'm also involved with, but like there are many other domains as I mentioned before. So one is, on education. So DHS2 has been used in education sector in different countries for more than five years now. I myself have been involved with the Sri Lanka implementation in DHS2 since 2019. So the thing is, again, it's a management information system. So as long as uh, any sector is matching the DHS2 data model, as I mentioned before, we can use it. So uh, as of now, we have more than 11 countries uh, across the globe, of course, mostly in Africa, but then we have uh, Sri Lanka from Asia, who are actively using at Ministry of Education level, DHS2, as their EMIS or as part of their uh, broader EMIS implementation. Uh, again, the main reason being in most of these countries, we are present and we are working uh, with the, uh, the health sector, and they are talking to the health sector and trying to understand what are the sustainable systems that they can adopt, right? So they never ask what are the most sophisticated systems that you can implement? Because just like health, uh, even the education sector has suffered trying to implement more sophisticated systems, which they can't sustain. So that's why we are seeing more and more countries adopting DHS2 in, uh, uh, in, in the education sector. And then of course, uh, one new innovation we have which is also contributing the SEMIS app uh, or, or the ext extensibility is the SEMIS. So very briefly, why this app came up is like we tried, right? We had we have the DHS2 capture app. We tried implementing DHS2 capture app in the education sector. So in health, it's more about we open a patient record and we take uh, notes of different symptoms and things like that. But in education, it's more like bulk data. So 
in the morning uh, teacher comes and you get the, uh, the 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 list of students and then you check right so it's more like there are so many bulk operations that happen in education sector so it was not really working our front ends so that's one main reason uh, we are like again uh, i will come back to be this uh, later so this is not a dh uh, university of oslo core application this was uh, designed collaboratively by all the different his groups uh, in asia and africa so we we got together we identified requirements and we discussed with ministries of education and understood what will work better and there are so many countries out of that 11 who are currently using this application extending the uh, the functionality that you had in dhis2 which has been evolving over three decades right and then of course climate health app you'll be hearing more and more about it this week so i'm not going into too much of detail but again in most of our health management information systems hmis in our countries we have health data aggregate data so it was a really uh, low hanging fruit for most of us when we have the health data to see how this i mean are there any correlations can we predict foreca forecast based on uh, the health data which we have and if we can get the climate data so again we could have done in a very traditional way uh, getting uh, health data i mean trying to find out climate data and manually entering into dhis2 but in most cases we simply did not have access to this climate data and it was a tedious task so that's why there are a lot of extensions including our climate app uh, which brings openly available data into dhis2 that is one and the next thing when it comes to climate i mean we always try to see whether it will rain in the afternoon right so it's more about forecasting modeling which is not really there in dhis2 so that's why there's currently a lot of work going on in modeling and we are working with different universities uh, with cutting edge technologies to see how we can kind of extend the functionality so again uh, i have mentioned here some of the countries which are using this climate uh, app and, and who are already part of this initiative and you can read more about it uh, in our link uh, that i have mentioned here and of course interoperability we have so many experts here it's a very big uh, uh, discussion session so there are already dedicated sessions in uh, in our annual conference on interoperability but i just wanted to highlight few things dhis2 is not just a dpg and a software it's more like a platform you can build things on top of it right so that's why it is different from the conventional digital public goods and then in many countries it is used as data warehouse meaning essentially rather than people entering data directly into dhis2 you will see more and more use cases where dhis2 is getting data from different sources and of course there are so many different tools which is helping to extend uh, uh, or like uh, which is supporting dhis2 to, to integrate with other platforms and solutions so we have the api and different supports for data formats like adx and of course our flexible data model we have standardized uh, metadata packages so that we make sure that this metadata is standard across most of the countries so uh, which really helps us in integrating systems i have already talked about the apps and uh, what is new is about dhs2 and fire i know like uh, my colleague from uh, sri lanka will also talk about it so i'm not going into detail and there are many uh, several countries i wouldn't say many who are uh, trying to uh, use dhs2 uh, with fire and you have more information about this integration effort uh, from our dhis2 website but i have listed here some of the digital public goods uh, which supports integration with dhis2 different uh, mechanisms are there and we have our integration team lead bob here so please uh, if you have any questions about integration i'm not an expert so but like we can have a discussion around uh, i mean whether there are different dpgs which are supported with dhis2 uh, yeah right so the golden question how is this made possible is there a secret recipe again technology is one thing so what we have talked mostly about as of now is the technology but it's not merely the technology what makes this very uh, possible there are many things but i have just uh, selected two areas which we keep on highlighting every year but uh, we have to do it because we see like if you don't have it this is one main reason why things don't uh, sustain first thing is about the capacity building so we have something called the hisp approach for building capacities so we are not a i mean hisp network uh, we have more than 20 nodes uh, 20 hisp groups worldwide so none of these uh, organizations are tech companies who just want to implement dhis2 in countries and just escape no no it doesn't work like that so what we 
aim to do is to work with governments, work with countries, and build capacity in ministries so that they can take things forward, right? Rather than getting, I mean, trying to get more and more contracts and try to implement DHS too. It's not kind of uh, the way we operate. And uh, we also have regional, uh, I mean, we have the country his groups and we have regional his, his pubs who try to identify the best practices and uh, uh, we share resources, right? We, we work together as a team and we share resources in supporting countries. Of course, we are building on the participatory design approach. Uh, and more and more, uh, something that we are seeing is like we kind of build on the HISP research. So, in fact, the HISP center here is a research center, and we have many of our scholars working around the globe. And uh, the photo that you are seeing here is, is something that we launched last year. We had three uh, regional workshops, one-week workshops. Uh, we call them information systems fundamentals workshops to try to research fundamentals workshop. Thank you for correction. Uh, where we we i mean the all the regional his groups together with the ministries so this fo photo is from a, a, a workshop we had in sri lanka where the ministry of education and health also participated in addition to all the his groups so we discuss of our implementation approach it is nothing technical it is more about how to build information systems which are sustainable so and then we take ministries into dialogue so they understand how, I mean, like they have to kind of, I mean, ministries generally, like again, some reflections from Sri Lanka Ministry of Health, they said, uh, whatever uh, uh, research that we publish is quantitative research. So we have to kind of identify whether there is a significance or something related to p-value and then that is only when things get published. No, it's not the same. There is another dimension uh, kind of, of research qualitative research, action research, where we go deep into identifying what are the things that make technology work. So this we uh, try to, I mean, we will be continuing. And in, in fact, uh, on day four, we have a separate session to discuss about uh, information systems research for data use. So please join that session if you are interested to know uh, what we discussed in that session. Okay. And our engagement is generally long term. And the next thing, of course, is about the network. So we have this global HISP network, uh, which has uh, more than 20 organizations working together with our HISP research approach. So uh, the logos that you are seeing here are HISP uh, groups from different uh, parts of the world who are working towards a common goal. And in addition, we have all these different resources, right? So there are no secrets. Uh, and uh, uh, the documentation is there and we have dedicated training. We have an online community where you all can, I mean, most of you are part of the community where you can get your uh, issues clarified. And we have routine communications by uh, means of newsletter, mailing list and webinar. And our aim is to empower community. I mean, all of you are part of community uh, where we will be able to work towards a common goal. Yeah, that's it. Thank you very much. Introduce uh, Malaka talking about the Hello, can you hear me? Okay, thanks. Uh, just to give you a highlight, since we're already short of time, uh, my name is Malaka and I work at his PTOP in Ethiopia, of course. I'm also a PhD student here, part of the DPG project. And I'll try to give you a bit of a highlight on how we try to incorporate DPG, which is DHS2 in the Ethiopian context. So to start with, we have this um, Ethiopian Digital Health Blueprint. This blueprint is being updated to a, a currently an e-health architecture. But looking at the blueprint, we have four major components in it. The first is the infrastructure, the data hub, the solutions and services, and the access and deliveries. These are considered as the pillars of the digital health. And in order to have these digital uh, health pillars, we have enablers that you see at the corner sites, which are system security, research and innovation, workforce, governance, and standards and interoperability. So I will come back to this. Uh, how DHS2 fits into this e-health architecture, but 
to give you a perspective of the implementations in Ethiopia, I will try to look into two or three use cases on how we use DHS to in multiple sectors. So to start with, we have this big initiative, which is called multi-sector Warada transformation. So the Warada or Warada means a district, basically it's a district. So uh, this multi-sector Warada transformation is is there to foster holistic development at the district or Warada level. And uh, it tries to achieve a coordinated effort between multiple sectors so that they can achieve a single target at a certain place. So the idea is sectors, individual sectors, try to implement different uh, in actions in order to achieve a better SDG goals. But the problem is because these implementation strategies are fragmented, they're silos, they don't really achieve well when compared to at a community level. So what the ministry wanted was to emphasize collaboration across sectors and to create a sustainable development. So the idea is for the SDGs to be targeted down to at Warada or at a district level. And then after that cascading, we will have a certain indicators chosen and those indicators will be aggregated into a single value that we can have out of 100. So this single value will incorporate within it the whole sector, not just health, it includes education, other sectors, and all those sectors will be combined together to create a single indicator that's going to be uh, visualized as, at one value. This will be used later on for the parliament and for additional leaders and for policymakers to have a better understanding of how each district is going to have. So. The general goal is to have transformed households, and then those households will be will incorporate into transformed districts, and then those districts will be coming a transformed a transformed nation at as at, at large. But this initiative didn't go as uh, to the pace that the Ministry of Health wants it. So they have decided to create sector specific Warada transformation. So this is when we talk about the country, the whole. It's silos, uh, there are different implementations, but within the Ministry of Health by itself, there are also different programs that are implemented in parallel and that do not really communicate with each other. So the idea was to use the lesson learned from the Warada Transformation Initiative and then build it into a sector specific, but which is the health itself, because it has different components of health which are, which are going by themselves so that they can jointly look at them as a whole. So the idea is to transform districts, health systems through improving investments and finding out high impact interventions. So you can see here that there are around five pillars. So these are the pillars. So quality of service, health financing, treatment with compassionate and care, information revolution and leadership and governance. So all of these are going to be encompassed into a single value and that value will be used to identify how a specific district is is performing in that region so the focus is on community engagement and it's to transform the whole warada but at a household level so all the indicators that are chosen in this initiative is based on household indicators so that the idea is to transform a single household, which will incorporate or which will be have a larger impact into a community level. So this single value that you see or uh, the total score that you see is compromised out of 600 data elements or data values. So these indicators are then going to in different uh, dimensions and it becomes out of thousand thousands of data elements that you incorporate into a single value which leaders can use because the problem is leaders will not be able to use each individual values they will not focus on indicators and things like that so they just want something that's catchy but at a multi-sectoral implementation this is one approach another implementation is the multi-sectoral food and nutrition system so this is also uh, in Ethiopia, I think most of you might know there is this Sokota declaration that tries to end child hunger by 2030. 
So the aim is to save around 7.8 billion lives in 15 years. It is a big initiative that the government really commits to and is trying to implement in this uh, in this period. So uh, in this case, uh, the idea is to take the lessons learned from the milk sectoral water transformation and implement it in the nutrition aspect. So this is also similar where different indicators from all the sectors, around nine sectors are incorporated into the system and those indicators are then combined to create a very visually appealing and easy to understand scoring mechanism. You can call it like a scorecard or something like that. So all these sectors come together and then they try to have a system that easily gives information to the leaders. So you can see here the signature made by the different ministries. So there are around nine different ministries that signed into this system. And currently there is this UNIS application that was developed in DHIS2 and that UNIS is using DHIS2. So DHIS2 is used here as well. And on the previous example that I showed you, the Word of transformation, it's also the same DHIS2 instance that we're using, which is the HMIS. And there are multiple implementations within that single instance that is there. So all these sectors are using the HMIS. So this is where my PhD comes in. I'm also a PhD student here. So the idea is how can we collaborate this, all the sectors coming together in a single system? So one example that uh, is challenging is when all the sectors are entering into the system it says dhs2 for health or ministry of health and then you have ministry of agriculture different ministries entering into this so we are trying to research into how we can make dhs2 better because we are already incorporating a lot of indicators some of the indicators are uh, i beg to defer to refer in some of hamud's presentation where he said if the countries meet the data model of DHIS2, but that is like DHIS2's data model is extensive by itself. It's not restricting you into it. We, uh, what we do is whenever you want to add additional data model, you have the flexibility without even touching the core or touching the software, you can extend the data model. So by doing that, we have been able to achieve all these indicator calculations into a single value that that is easily presentable. Since I have no time, I'll try to move a bit. In addition to these multi-sector implementations, there are also other interoperability initiatives that we have. So those inter interoperability initiatives are somehow connected to DHS2. So that's because DHS2 is part of or is becoming the central part of the ministry and it's where almost all the data or most of the data of the ministry is located at. I think this is obvious for different countries, especially for LMIC countries, which are similar to Ethiopia. So DHIS2 contains a lot of information and it has different information. So other implementations or other DPGs are thinking of integrating into it. So we have the master facility registry, which uses another DPG, OpenHIM. We have community health information systems integ being integrated into DHIS2. We have MOSIP being integrated into DHIS2 for different uh, civil registrations uh, for EMR projects. We also have OpenMRS that is being integrated into DHIS2. All of these are currently going on. And as a country, this interoperability is a big issue and it's a big initiative that we're currently working on. So, why all this as a country? Why do we have all this embedded into DHS2? And what is the reason behind it? So the first is it's one of the trusted DPGs because it's backed up by this network of community. We have different HISP groups in different countries and it's trusted that it will not go anywhere. It's trusted that it will stay at least for the coming 10 or 20 years. So the fact that it's trusted and it will remain being updated gives a confidence that the ministry should use it for different implementations. There is an established user base with local expertise. The established user base is in thousands, 
I think most countries have that. But the, in addition to that, there are universities which incorporated the use of DHIS2 into their curriculums, in their master's programs, into their uh, degree programs. And there is always a continuous user trainings that are being there. In addition to that, there are local expertise, uh, local companies like Hispitopia and other local companies that use and that customize DHIS2. The, it is continuously evolving system. It does not stick. Currently, we're talking about climate health. We're talking about modeling and additional features. The fact that it's generic and adaptable to different solutions makes it easily uh, the first choice. So whenever there is a new requirement, the government just asks that, is it going to be capable in DHS2? If it is, then no other system will be considered for that case. And Finally, it's highly flexible for various needs. Because it's flexible for various needs, we are currently trying to change the shift of or to change the implementation way for multi-sector implementations. So for the previous multi-sector implementations that I told you, because the ministry is so fast in doing things, now we're trying to think of a different implementations. So those different implementations is that the challenge is most sectors, unlike health, are not that active in their MI systems. So what uh, is proposed is to use DHIS2 within those sectors, not just to collect those sectors, but we want DHIS2 to be used within those sectors. Currently, we are in discussion with uh, Ministry of Agriculture and with Education to implement it within themselves so that it can be easily interoperable with all these multi-sectoral initiatives to have a better outcome. So the benefits will be easier communication between sectors. So Minister of Health can easily communicate with Minister of Agriculture or all the sectors. And then we can establish a long lasting digital public infrastructure where all these sectors have their own implementations of DHS2 and then they can talk to each other easily. And then we can have that, that will or that aspiration where all digitalization infrastructures will be helping the community at large. And finally, it will position, or it's already positioned, where DHIS2 will become a building block for all these sectors, especially in their MIS architecture, so that it will create a digital, a digital interface. Thank you. I hope I didn't take that much time. And uh, welcome to Sri Lanka. Uh, uh, good afternoon, everybody. Uh, so I'm Dr. Veer Badan from uh, Ministry of Sri Lanka. A little bit intimidating to uh, present to a DHIS2 expert community. I'm I'm no expert in DHIS2. Uh, my area of expertise is in uh, interoperability, and I'm running the National Electronic Health Record uh, uh, Initiative for the country. And um, okay. yeah, okay. Um, so, a um, little bit about uh, DHIS2, how it happened in Sri Lanka, I think uh, uh, in 2007, uh, through a NOMA grant, uh, there's, uh, there's a collaboration between the Health Informatics Society of Sri Lanka, University of Oslo, and uh, uh, University of Colombo uh, in creating this master's program in biomedical informatics. And that created this capacity within the country uh, to uh, start implementing uh, digital health solutions. and. Because of the University of uh, Oslo uh, collaboration, we had a lot of people who learned uh, DHIS2. Uh, and we started small scale initiatives in the country. Uh, and that grew into uh, much uh, complex uh, systems uh, currently. So um, I'll not dwell on much of them because uh, I think uh, this has been widely you know, publicized. Uh, uh, ER HMI system is one of the, um, you know, uh, more complex and uh, very uh, 
widely used system in Sri Lanka uh, for a rehabilitative, uh, sorry, um, uh, reproductive and maternal and child health uh, uh, program uh, that's run by the Family Health Bureau. Um, so it, it collects both aggregate and uh, individual data, um, national scale implementation, uh, and uh, you know, uh, so many other advantages as well. And um, I think the the local capacity as well as the expertise in the country, along with our collaborations with the, the community and the University of Oslo, uh, was highlighted when the COVID came. Um, there was no time to learn a new system and implement something. We already had capacity in the country, and uh, you know, uh, people like Pamod, Priyanga, Pramil, um, you know, all of them are active in the community, I suppose. Uh, uh, came up with uh, this, uh, you know, the metadata set for, uh, you know, uh, uh, COVID surveillance and all of that uh, helped, I think, place the uh, DHIS2 in a much greater stature in the country. It exposed the solutions that were running within the health domain into ICT domain. You know, a lot of people in the ICT domain started to know about the solution. Uh, a lot of people in the you know the education sector we uh, had a collaboration with the immigration department uh, to get some data uh, from them so that exposed i suppose uh, the solution to uh, outside of the uh, health system and now most of the you know other ministries are also uh, relying on dhis2 and one such is the education department uh, where in 2019 they started uh, a formal engagement and now uh, now they are looking into this model where they, you know, develop the capacity within the Ministry of Education so that the initiatives are more sustainable rather than, you know, just buying a solution out of box. And uh, I'm happy to say that, uh, you know, the History Sri Lanka is supporting uh, those initiatives well. Um, and for me, uh, this is the important part for me, um, you know, running the National Digital Health uh, platform setting up. So we came up with the uh, National Digital Health Blueprint uh, a couple of years back. And now we are trying to set up something. And uh, uh, we ran three connectathons in the country uh, to share data. Um, so we have EMR solutions in silos. And now we, we are trying to create a centralized repository. Uh, and we are leveraging on fire standards uh, for that. And also uh, some DPGs, some are not. Uh, you know, to uh, coherently work together uh, to deliver this uh, capability. And when we create all of that, uh, you know, uh, data, big data store, now we want to look into that and, you know, develop analytics so that we can actually start using that data other than uh, for clinical, uh, you know, uh, clinical use cases. So that's where we, were, we are thinking of um, uh, using uh, DHIS2. Um, so um, here, this is a part from the um, uh, blueprint. Um, so we have the uh, uh, NEHR or National Electronic Health Record. Uh, through the interoperability layer, we want to fetch some of this data uh, and uh, support uh, secondary use cases. And um, here, uh, how we want to do it is uh, we want to create a KPI definition uh, repository and any data that is coming through the interoperability layer that matches any of those KPI definitions, we want to capture them and probably feed into uh, uh, you know, a data warehouse. And we see a uh, big value in you know, having DHIS2 type uh, uh, you know, a flexible platform uh, to do that. And uh, the, uh, I can see Andreas as well. So uh, we have a project in Sri Lanka um, called Diabetes Compass, uh, supported by, uh, you know, World Diabetic Federation. And they are trying to use uh, a mobile app to go into the community and collect data, uh, which goes to a fire repository. So it's like the NHR that we are going to create. And when um, that data uh, uh, or, you know, the elements in that uh, data bundle uh, matches certain criteria, they take it up and send to uh, DHIS2 um, so that they can create the uh, you know indicators that are required for the management of the uh, program as well as clinical indicators that that help the Ministry of Health um, you know the non-communicable disease uh, program 
uh, to uh, evaluate what they are doing. So uh, this is what uh, excites me, uh, and uh, you know how I want the DHIS to to basically um, help the NHR effort uh, in the country. So. Uh, in Sri Lanka, we do uh, have uh, DHIS2 instances uh, across multiple domains like the health uh, and the uh, uh, you know the education, and I think uh, you are talking about the climate aspects as well. Uh, and then uh, we have in the within the health also we have at national level like in the national uh, uh, electronic health record, and as well as within the project um, in a smaller you know uh, scope. Uh, but nevertheless, a very important scope. Uh, so, um, to me, uh, that's I have to say. So, uh, having the internal capacity has helped us to uh, do a lot, uh, and I think we should invest in that. Um, and um, uh, interoperability within the uh, you know the uh, architecture. So, supporting fire. Uh, currently, we are not. I think we are not innately supporting fire as such. Uh, but there is a bit of a transformation to be done, and we have leverage on other solutions to do so. Um, uh, and also, we see that uh, you know, if you take one year to plan and then you execute, uh, probably the use case has changed a little bit as well. So the you know the way we do it, uh, we had three connections uh, already over a you know a couple of months period, and uh, we are planning for the fourth in uh, July, uh, which is more mostly. Uh, you know, towards analytics, um, and we are using multiple platforms, and we want DHIS2 also uh, to be uh, part of it. Um, uh, you know, uh, uh, creating these dashboards and you know other uh, secondary use case, uh, uh, you know, uh, deliverables. Uh, so this is what I have to say. Um, uh, if you have any questions, if it's DHIS2, I'm happy to promote this here. <laughs> if it's on uh, other aspects of the National Electronic Health Record or the fire. Uh, uh, interoperability, I can uh, help you. Thank you. For Q and A, and now you guys can start to start to ask questions. We'll see whether this, for the sake of this, we will bring you. Any questions? Yep. And so already, call after. Then you need to send it around. Let's see if it works. We'll, we'll make we'll, we'll make it work. We'll make it work. Uh, I would love to thank you so much for the presentations. Uh, I work mainly promoting DHS2 in Latin America, and I would like love to hear your thoughts on this. Uh, essentially, I find that there's a huge lack of awareness of digital public goods and infrastructure, a lot at the domain level, which are most of the time the ones actually deciding what is going to be implemented. But we're not going to get implemented if they don't even know we exist. Uh, and a lot of the funding that we see happens for the implementation, which is great. That's what we needed. But but for the communication, for the awareness raising, we are competing with huge software companies who have lobbying budgets, who have trade fair budgets, who have nice pens to give out uh so so there i would love to hear your thoughts about that about that disparity between the two and how we can raise that awareness in this this kind of context and then Pamut, to your list i would like to add one thing that the hs2 has is localization right being localizable uh i think that's an incredibly important thing that we have and not a lot of other dpgs do so my my wish to the dpg alliance would be to have localization as part of the 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 what's it called the dpg standard because we find that super important for the region thank you because you managed yourself yeah yeah i don't need that no no it's not for me it's not for us even i know uh i basically had two comments really than questions and it's to the alliance I found that last slide you had with the overview, the opportunities, there's two at least aspects I really miss. One is the fundamental issue of corruption and, shall we say, distorted commercial and ideological interests right, that always enter into these discussions. I can take South Africa as an example. I've lived there for over 20 years. And, you know, the reason the HIS was so successful there was that we were too small. By 2010, when the minister finally stopped new information systems from being implemented, the South Africa had spent $2 billion on almost every single large 
commercial system ended up in court as uh, you know with corruption and so forth related to it whereas our probably global including oslo global spending on system development by that time was one percent of that two billion twenty million dollars right over the whole 15 year period we were too small the corrupt people were not interested in what we were doing so we could do things okay so i and and you can take the example of, of norway here now middle of norway they are implementing for hundreds of millions of dollars an american epic system is a disaster the staff hates it it destroys the economy of many of these hospitals but management does not want to give it up so again it shows this sort of distorted political interest so i say you need to take that into consideration consideration otherwise you can't really plan the the second point just very briefly is that we tend to no longer really talk about the use of many of these systems. When he started in 1994, he had a heavy emphasis on community activism, right? On creating new information systems for people. And I must say gradually, and I was part of that, that faded away. We became more and more partners to government, meaning that bosses, leadership of the government, and we are no longer even thinking about how we can decide system that sort of sneaks in the people and the back door and allows people access. And I see that in, in Norway too. You know, if, if my lab results are being sent to a private lab, I can access the results. If it goes via a public lab, I have no access to it. I have to go to beg my doctor for it. So again, I think it's important here that we think about these di digital public goods not only as tools for government and better organization, better service delivery, but also as tools for people to access their own data and data of similar people. I would love to, for whatever conditions fails me, I would love to see what is happening with all the others in Norway or in Europe or in Africa or whatever that suffers from the same element. How are they faring? Right. I would love to do that as a person, but I have no way of doing it. Thank you. Maybe do the vices here and it might have works. I did this as well. I think you can later go and uh you know say facts. We can have a beer. Always happy to have a beer. There will be opportunities at all. Thank you. Uh, hope you can hear me. <laughs> yeah, speak up. Yeah. Uh, thank you uh, for the presentation. I'm Christian. I just had one question for Maliki. So, yeah, I just wanted to understand, maybe you mentioned it, but um, you do collect a lot of data points, um, which it's an observation in statistics. So, and you come up with figures at the end of the day. So, do you, does it go through like a model, machine learning model, how do you come up with the, uh, the numbers that you share? You mentioned 7.8 million uh, children in, within a specific time frame, so, or the numbers that you had on the graph. So, yeah, thanks. What's governmental? <laughs> yeah, thank you. My name is Joshua Loga, working for PATH. Uh, I just want to ask you from the first presentation, uh, you mentioned about um, those priority use cases on the uh, DPI. So, um, and there you mentioned about the uh, identity exchange and and, and uh, payment. So, do, is there any consideration about the warehousing system, data warehousing system, maybe like BHS2? Is it one of the priority? Uh, use case to be considered as a uh, in a DPI, or is just only these uh, three um, uh, use cases that I mentioned? Uh, another question is about the Ethiopia. Maybe I would like to understand more on the DHS two uh, integration with uh, MOSIP that you mentioned. If you can elaborate more, thank you. One more, and then I really think we need to give uh, these yeah. guys. Uh, I'll make it very very short. Um, uh, Andreas, World Diabetes Foundation. So I think it's mostly to live um, because I know the others a little bit, so don't mind me. Um, 
but I was happy to see I'm, I'm echoing a little bit what you're addressing. I'm curious and I'm maybe a bit more specific level, these existing interests that, that, that lie in a country in terms of health information systems, now that we are in that realm, uh, it's nice with DPGs. We would love to support it. Uh, and all of that. But what do we do in our specific context as a foundation who wants to support the strengthening of data quality at source levels? We don't want to introduce new systems. We have quite non-commercial, non we're a non-profit. And we see in countries like in Sri Lanka, Tanzania, Malawi, where we've started piloting our first digital health interventions, that there are very big EMR, HMIS systems in place. We don't want to disrupt that environment. We want to support it. And how do we do that, given that they are proprietary, in some instances, legacy systems. So how do you actually, how do you embrace these building blocks in a meaningful way? We are big on supporting fire and interoperability, but then all of a sudden you get into a much more complicated space. Um, and so the story goes. So what's the, what's the solution there? Well, then I guess you need to start with more like this. It's, um, right? so like next, it's not <laughs> Okay, thank you. My name is Wondemo. I'm from Global Fund. So just I do have very uh, quick two questions uh, about data warehouse. Uh, 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 and first of all, I would like to appreciate all presenters for the nice presentation. Uh, as you see, um, DHIS2 is more focused on the routine uh, uh, health information system management. Would it be possible to include also non-routine uh, information system and then we can triangulate, you know, uh, results? That's one question. And the second one is uh, DHIS2 is uh, still, you know, more in administrative level because data is, you know, uh, the two advantage. The one, the first one is primary advantage is quality of care at point of data generation still DHIS2 is not, you know, uh, well implemented at facility and community level that's to improve, you know, uh, uh, quality of care. So is there any possibility to consider like clinical supporting system using through DHIS2? Thank you. Over. Thank you. Then Monica, can you start? Then leave the floor to yeah, uh, thank you for most of the questions and uh, <laughs> <laughs> only most of them. Yeah, no, I mean, all of the questions. <laughs> I'm just talking about the ones from uh, director to me. So, uh, just to give you the estimate, the 7.8 million is an ambition of the government. But so, the government wants to end. Uh, because there is a lot of malnutrition deaths, uh, both Sam and Mom. So the government's aim is to stop that death by 2030. It's not an estimated, it's just an ambition of the government to end those deaths. Uh, but the, the way DHS2 is working, we are trying to uh, integrate these prediction algorithms. I think there are separate sessions for that if you're interested. So those predictions will come based on the climate health and other inputs. So I think there are sessions for that. Uh, to answer about the integrations we have with MOSIP, uh, so MOSIP is being implemented in, at a national scale and there's a huge uh, implementation across the uh, country. So there are different initiatives, actually multiple initiatives that we are currently working as a country to integrate MOSIP. It's the one, the first is birth and death notification. It's currently on plan. To integrate MOSIP, so we want to update the national ID where there is birth and death. Uh, another implementation is for vaccines. Uh, there are different vaccines that is including the COVID vaccine. So for those vaccine implementations, there is an an initiative going on to integrate for TBs actually TB tracker. Uh, it's I think uh, being done by JSI. There is an an initiation to integrate with. MOSIP. There are actually uh, different initiatives, but these are the ones that are on top of my head now. Uh, there are questions. Because uh, you could time. I'm actually uh, heading off soon to, to have another session in 10 minutes. So I, uh, me, I have to leave really soon, but leave. <laughs> Please. I, I, I will repeat the thing. Wait for you. <laughs> Thanks for some of the questions. <laughs> no, I'll be I'll be very quick. Um, 
So to Latin America, um, very much agree. I, I think the good news is that there are, uh, I can't say mm -hmm. names of countries that haven't been announced yet, but there are multiple Latin American and Caribbean countries uh, en route to joining the Digital Public Goods Alliance and also um, uh, active partners in this shift in five initiative that I mentioned. So we're seeing a lot of demand. Uh, IADB uh, is, uh, so the Inter-American Development Bank is a member of the DPG and we actually have really, really good counterparts there who are actively uh, very actively promoting DPGs in the region. However, uh, I, I very much agree that there is a lot of potential to do more joint advocacy, and I would love also to work with uh, everyone on the kind of myth busting around open source because there's a lot of, and I think this also touches upon some of the uh, topics that were raised later, that there's a lot of um, direct attempts to undermine open source in general by saying open source is not secure and just kind of spreading this kind of a gen general stories, which are obviously you can have bad open source, you can have bad proprietary. It has to do with how well things have been built and you can have more eyes on the ball and so on. Everyone knows that here with open source. So, but basically there are many attempts and I think we can as a community also work more actively to do some with busting. Uh, but yes, from our end, we are ramping also up our advocacy work, hopefully more also in support of DPGs. Uh, on the localization issue, I think it is if we start to have all, all localizations on the DPG registry, the DPG registry would over time probably become very, very big and complex. I think there is a balance to, to that. We are trying to make sure we can uh, capture more maturity information. Uh, so I think that goes some way towards, uh, because I do think there is a case for trying to show better uh, that. But I I think there's there are some pros and cons of, of trying to, to list um uh, localizations uh, on the corruption completely agree my um i i'm a political scientist i'm always big in favor of trying to depoliticize very very co um controversial issues it's always hard to talk about corruption uh in countries um i think for instance procurement uh, and open source policies there are ways of actually at least trying to go more directly at the core of some of the issues uh, through those kind of discussions um, so, so, but I, I very much agree. I'm, I'm curious to hear how you would like to see it incorporated in the slide, though, because how would you write it? Like, fight corruption, yes. But, but uh, uh, I, I agree, it's a huge problem. There are many vested interests, and we're spending a lot of time, as I was saying, on this kind of hearing the same. Um, th there's a lot of um, both active disinformation and also kind of just information pollution happening um uh in in this space uh and and uh, we are trying from our end and uh, this week we're having a big country learnings and best practice exchange uh, on open source first policies and procurements and how to reform procurements which i think is one of the most important things we can do uh on the corruption side and also maybe i'm not sure if i completely grasped the last question i'm going to segue to Pabod anyway because it sounded like Sri Lanka specific. <laughs> so then I'll uh, I'll save that one. Um yes and I agree on the community uh, community side and I like I, I very often say that it's digital public goods is it's not about it, it's an international digital cooperation model. It's it's a new way of collaborating more than just the technologies themselves. And I think that is um I, I very much agree about the community side of it, and I think it is often under-communicated, and I think I've said this every year I've been here, that uh, it is the thing that is the most underappreciated uh, about the HIS2, uh, when people who don't who are not familiar with the HIS model, it's the very, very uh, extensive community and the hub structure, and it's something I would love to see more of, and I, I believe me, I'm working a lot on encouraging how we can fertilize it in different means, including those nine PhDs that Kristin mentioned from a couple of years ago here, but also for other DPGs uh, and and uh, and communities. Um, I think that's almost as much far as I got. I tried. I snuck a bit on the last one. <laughs> I didn't catch it fully. Yeah, sure. yeah, I think we can discuss later. <laughs> so should be... I, you can continue, but you know, five minutes from now, I'm leaving the session on card out. But uh, I'm, I'm confused thinking you're, you're lacking your coffee. The coffee break is actually afterwards at four o'clock. <laughs> <laughs> so you don't miss anything. As long as you go to the next session, whenever in, in the. 
seven minutes. Okay. Right. So, uh, I, yeah, I think we can conclude. Uh, <laughs> it was, it was just uh, two. I think I agree with uh, Enzo about localization. Yes, definitely. I uh, just didn't have too much space in that slide to add. <laughs> and the next thing about the routine health information. So no, DHS two is commonly used in routine health uh, uh, information, but like. Uh, there is nothing preventing uh, to you, for you to use DHS for, for example, surveys. So there are a lot of agile implementations. So only thing that you have to keep in mind is, again, like about the data model. So if you stick to the data model, you are safe. But like you have exceptional implementations where you have a lot of expertise involved, where you will try to extend the data model. But otherwise, as long as you can map it to your requirement to the data model, that's fine. I think, uh, yeah, we can. Just want to add like... Uh... So in the, in the master's program and the MD program in Sri Lanka, we are more towards, uh, you know, uh, DHIS2 because the, we inherited that from, uh, you know, uh, from the beginning. Uh, what the Ministry of Health currently trying to do is to include other uh, DPJs into the curriculum. So if you know about it, of course, you will start using it, right? And the other thing is, as, uh, you know, uh, corruption is a problem. Uh, the uh, inefficiencies and bureaucracy, bureaucracy in our you know countries is also a problem and uh, i think if you have the capacity in your country uh, before all of that uh, you know the corruption set in you can create uh, you know people like pamod uh, create uh, solutions using uh, dpgs and then they get adopted and maintained rather than you know uh, corrupt system so that's what i have to add uh, thank you thank you so much. Thank you, everyone. Yeah.